We have a very special guest on hold right now. I'm going to get right to him. His name is Spike Cohen. He's got a huge presence on social media. He's a thinker. He's an activist. He's a spokesperson for human freedom on The Ray Appleton Show uh, with Clint Olivier. Spike, welcome to the show. Thanks, Clint. Thanks for having me on again, man. Good to talk to you. Well, we love you here, and and I I do love having you on because I love to talk about freedom, and I love to, to try and teach freedom and and uh, hear from folks that call in, and you are out there accomplishing that same mission every single day, which is teaching freedom across the country and across the world. It, it's your life's mission, so I appreciate that you have some time for us today. Um, Absolutely, man. I mean, this is part of it. Well, and we, we're coming out of the, you know, and, and when I talked to, with your your scheduler, we, we said, well, what are we going to talk about? Well, we'll do some ana- election analysis. We'll talk about some current events. The the usual stuff. You and I have a, a pretty good rapport because we've done this once before. Um, oh, yeah. But we're coming out of a, a conversation. I, 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 we were talking about an article. The, the people smarter than you and I in, in the world have decided that mm. uh, the world is going to end in nine years because of climate mm. change. And the way to stop that is to take money from poor people in rich nations and give that money to rich people and despots in poor nations, and then they'll make the climate change go away. Um, yes. Yes. Where, where, are, where are you at? I mean, you're a thinker. And you are um, a, a spokesperson for, uh, for, for rationality and free speech and free thought. Where do you come down on this whole climate change the world's going to end in, in 10 years? Uh, well, I, I think that my thoughts on climate change are similar to my thoughts on COVID. I think that they're real. I think that we should have a serious discussion about them. Uh, and I think that the so-called experts, the government appointed experts are the absolute last people that we should hear from and that any uh, action or uh, restriction or orders uh, ordered or undertaken by government are going to serve only to make everything worse and not address the actual problem. I mean, we just saw that with COVID. We saw them demand lockdowns. We saw them to say, don't buy masks, whatever you do. Actually, you have to wear masks. Actually, those masks are useless. Uh, we watched them say, oh, you need to get this vaccine. It's going to stop uh, COVID in its track. So actually it doesn't, but you still have to get it or you lose your job. Oh, actually it turns out if you're under 18, it's probably more of a risk to get it than not to get it. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, we watch this over and over again and, uh, and I've been saying this from day one, man, uh, if you didn't like what happened during the, uh, the COVID lockdowns and the COVID regime, uh, they were gearing up for climate change. All of the uh, the verbiage and the warnings and the fear mongering and the death porn that they imposed on us for the better part of two and a half years, uh, they're going to do that with climate change. Anytime there's a disaster, anytime there's anything, they're going to say, oh, time for another climate lockdown. It may not happen this year or next uh, or even the year after, but we will see them begin to slowly walk us in that direction. And we need to uh, recognize that's going to happen and be ready for some serious mass noncompliance because that's the only thing that's going to stop it. Well, it's interesting that that you brought that up because in the in the hour, I mean, you weren't listening. You're out of state, but I was talking about how every and and I'm I'm a former journalist by trade. I, I did ten years on television for a number of different affiliates in the West, and I, just as a reporter, the way they frame every storm as historic. It's historic. It's it's a historic yeah. drought. Oh, it's historic rain. It's historic snow. Mm-hmm. You know, when the when the ski resorts open up three weeks early, it's because of climate change. When they open up a month late, oh, it's because of climate change. I think that's I think they're being very, very dishonest by by labeling a every weather event as historic. Well, and when, for example, two or three years in a row now, we've had a historic low number of hurricanes and other um, uh, tropical cyclones. They don't say anything. They don't say, oh, good news. Remember when we told you that you were all going to die if you lived anywhere near the east or west coast of the United States? Turns out that was wrong. It actually was a lot better than we thought. That's great news. Makes us question uh, if we should be predicting uh, the weather patterns based on uh, predictions of of climate change. Uh, And that's why they don't talk about it. Because if you say this is going to happen because this is the most serious threat we face, and then that thing doesn't happen, then they have to talk about whether or not that is actually the most serious thing they, that we face or if they have any idea of being of how their modeling works or anything else and i mean it, it's that's the problem is that we only hear the bad news we don't hear the great news that you know they're more often wrong than they're right well i i have a saying that that i like to 
to use where I say belief in climate change is belief that the California state legislature can control the weather. (laughs) And the California state legislature cannot control the weather, and neither can the Canadian Parliament, and neither can the United States Congress, and neither can the the United Nations cannot control the weather, but they they think they can. And if it's not about... If it, it, I was talking about how if California disappeared off the face of the earth and Canada and all the Canadians disappeared off the face of the earth, it doesn't even move the needle in their own yeah. models. It doesn't even move the exactly. needle. So exactly. what's the point, Spike? Why are they doing it? Well, the point is control. And the point is the, the real point, And this is what I try to tell people who think that the problem is free trade. The problem is not free trade. The problem is that you have a regime that is composed of the uh, multinational corporations that own our government and their sponsored politicians who impose regulations domestically here and in other uh, Western countries. They impose regulations because those oligarchs control the uh, production and distribution out of the these third world countries and out of these dictatorships like China and other countries like that. And they want to be the only ones who can afford to do business. So they intentionally make it cost prohibitive to do business here, to hire people here, to make things here, to distribute things here. And they go and have it to where they already have their closed shop set up. And that's why they're doing this. All of the fear mongering, all of that comes down to, we actually don't care about climate change at all. We're actually sending all of the jobs to the biggest polluters, which are uh, Brazil, Russia, uh, China, India, India, Turkey, and so forth, and uh, and because we control the market there. We have the best relationships there. We're the only ones that can afford to retrofit our entire base of operations over there. That's what this whole thing boils down to, is choking off their smaller competition, imposing control, and imposing more fear-based, uh, you know, uh, more fear on the population to get them to be more behind the idea of government controlling every aspect of their lives. It's what it's always about. More money for them, more power for them, uh, more control over us. Well, you paint a you you paint a bleak picture, Spike. Good <laughs> yes. grief! Happy well, Thanksgiving, everyone. Yeah, no kidding. Well, you know what? <laughs> now that we're going to be like a, a 1990s infomercial. Now that we've presented yes. the, uh, the 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 problem, when we come back on the other side of this break, Spike Cohen, our guest, will present the solution. And and without spoiling it for you, it has something to do with liberty, folks. Liberty with freedom. Our guest this hour is Spike Cohen. He is a thought leader. He is, he is I guess, when, when thinking becomes criminal, Spike's going to be the first one they, they haul out. Um, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, you know, the, before we went to break, we were talking about what, what they, and I say in quotes, they uh, have in store for us. Uh, and, and I kind of alluded to the solution, not just to the, the, the climate tyrants that, that run the state of California and really run the world, but it's, it's the solution for everything, and that is freedom. Am I right? Absolutely, you're right. I mean, it, it, there's two ways, two aspects to how to solve this problem or what the solution is. The first thing is to uh, deal with the damage that's already been done and undo that. And then the, the second part is making sure that there's no damage moving forward, no new damage. The way to deal with the old damage is to look at all of these regulatory uh, schemes and regimes that have been put in place supposedly to protect workers or to protect consumers or protect the environment or whatever else, realize that they're them for the scam that they are, and uh, move to massively repeal them. Um, and the way to move forward on any new potential damage is we have to stop falling for wind. And I say we because this is not just people on the left. There are uh, the majority of voters when their preferred politicians get in front of them and say, in order to deal with crisis ABC, we have to impose restriction XYZ. And what I encourage people to do is ignore whatever their pretext is and look at what what uh, powers they're trying to get or what regulations they're trying to impose and realize that no matter what excuse they're using for why they need these powers or these tax this new tax money or what Whatever they're asking for, understand it's going to be used against you, whether they're saying it's for terrorism or climate change or violent crime or illegal immigration or gun violence or whatever else they say. Understand what they're really saying is I've come up with an incredible excuse that I'm going to use to get you to support me putting more power and imposing more control over you, taking more money from you and making your life harder and not even dealing with the problem that I used as a, as a flimsy pretext to begin with. That's what we need to be doing. Well, it. <laughs> 
Look, you and I are are the same. We are we are libertarians. Um, I I happen to be a, a registered Republican, uh, like Ron Paul, uh, who is a libertarian but caucused with the the Republicans because I mean, mm-hmm. and and you are I mean you are a registered member of the Libertarian Party. Um, it's funny. I went to a, a, a workshop once, and it was uh, Lou Rockwell, who's another libertarian thought leader, uh, and Ron Paul. And Ron Paul, mm-hmm. if you don't remember, was the congressman from the, the Corpus Christi area of Texas, and he was uh, wonderful in Congress for many decades, talking about freedom, talking about how getting government out of the way is is the the biggest thing we need to do. Anyway, Ron's retired now, but they were on this panel. And Lou Rockwell doesn't believe in any voting at all. And I, I knew that going in. And, of course, Ron is a, is a politician, so he likes voting. And I put my hand up, and they called on me, and they said, you know, man in the back. And I said, this question is for both panelists. So what do we do? We're, we're doing what libertarians do, complaining, commiserating about these problems, trying to find some, some solutions. And I said, so what do we do? Vote harder? Just keep, oh, I'm going to vote harder this cycle. Yeah. Um, yep. And I said, so what do we do? Lou, do we vote? Ron, do we vote? And it was funny because these are two guys that agree on almost everything. Uh, but Lou said this. He said, I don't vote. He said, voting is the sacrament of the state, and I do not partake. So Lou votes yeah. by not voting. And then Ron Paul gets up and he says, well, you know, you, you got to vote. You got to make your voice heard. You got to vote. Right. So they disagreed on that. They're they're two smart, smart dudes. They're libertarians, but they disagree on whether or mm-hmm. not people should vote. So I'm asking you as a libertarian who obviously you're you at you, you go out looking for votes because you have run for office and may may do so again. I hope you do. Um so what's the answer, though, Spike? Voting doesn't seem to change anything. What, what, is, what do you recommend? That everybody vote Libertarian? Well, I, yes, I would recommend everyone <laughs> vote Libertarian. But I, I want to say this. Voting alone changes absolutely nothing, especially if you're voting for Libertarians or for Libertarian candidates. Because until we have a movement of people who agree with us that's large enough for us to actually effectively contend in elections or get enough uh, uh, in, in opinion polls to qualify for debates at the national level, it's just going to continue to be an exercise in futility. And that's why, Clint, the last year and a half, I have spent less and less time being involved in electoral politics and more and more time being involved on the cultural end in in bringing the liberty movement to people in their communities and showing them how statism is failing them and how liberty will set them free. That's what I do with my organization, You Are the Power. We are nonpartisan. We have Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, non-voting anarchists and everything in between (laughs) who uh, come together under the cause of finding people who are being harmed by their local governments, helping them to organize and uh, and work to get justice for their cause and accountability for the people who did it to them, and then using that as an opening conversation about how this we're just going to keep playing whack-a-mole with corrupt governments around the country until we finally can see that government control is the problem and that liberty and putting power back in the hands of the people is the solution. And and until we get a a large enough number of people behind us, we're going to continue to to play the games we've been playing. And that's why I'm working more and more on, you know, recognizing that politics is downstream of culture and that we have to build a culture of liberty. And that's, that's the work I do every day. Well, and, and we thank you for it. I think that, the, the, you know, like I, I like to think the KMJ audience, that we get everybody, Democrats and liberals and, and climate change panickers and bedwetters, and we get, <laughs> we get conservatarians. I mean, it's a huge audience, and it, it's very diverse. And so I, I, I don't think that anybody would disagree with, with what you said. I mean, I'm, I'm passionate about freedom being the, uh, the, the solution to these problems, Um you know, but we'll just have to see. I have a question for you now. What sure. Spike, what is it going to take for people to turn to freedom and and demand it? Because remember when the the truck drivers were in Ottawa, Canada and they were yeah. they're protesting against uh uh Justin Castor, I mean Justin Trudeau's um <laughs> That's that's my favorite conspiracy theory. By I know, the way, mine the, too. The look, the look is is 
spot on. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. No, you're, if you don't know what we're talking about, Google Justin Trudeau, Fid- Fidel Castro. All right, that's all I'll say about that. But the, <laughs> the truckers were in the, uh, the capital of Canada, and they were jamming the streets, and they were demanding freedom. And I, I forget what yeah. it was about. It was had to do something with, with diesel or the, something. The vaccine mandate. Ah, the vaccine yeah. mandate, right. And and the news stories, well, they're they're Nazis, they're Third Reich, and they're yep. beating people up, and they're thugs, and they're and then we hear eight months later that all of those things were unfounded. So, Spike, yep. if those people who stand up for liberty are vilified, and now they've been tagged with fascist Nazi, that's they're they're diminished and brushed away. The I say, yep. I'm Emma Lazarus, I'm lear- I'm yearning to breathe free. And yet my media, my government demonize me and are calling me horrible names. I just don't want to get a vaccine to go to work. And now you call me a Nazi. How, yep. how can Spike, when people do speak out, they're being smashed down. I mean, not with a truncheon, but they're being smashed down with, with media and, and false reports and lies. How, how are people going to learn that they, that, that they need, that they have to speak out? Yeah. So and not only I mean, some of them were physically smashed down. And the interesting thing is, uh, starting back in the beginning of October, uh, the Trudeau regime uh, ended all of the uh, mandates and and vaccine passports and everything that were remaining, which, according to him, means that he stands with Nazis and racists and so forth. Um, But the 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 answer to that is we have to the, the problem is that the movement for liberty, the movement of people who understand intuitively that freedom is the best way forward in all things is too small. There are a good number of us, but we're way outnumbered by a lot of well-meaning, well-thinking friends and neighbors and loved ones of ours who just don't get it and who think that freedom, if anything, is a, is a little bit dangerous. And we need, if anything, maybe even a little bit more control. And the way that I'm working to do that, there, there are, you know, whatever your talents are, you should be using them to try to spread a message of unvarnished freedom. The talents that I am using are in putting together an organization that is helping people who are being harmed by their local governments, inviting an organization organizing for their neighbors to join them in seeking justice. And then while we have their attention, have them engaged, have them excited, continue to work with them on other issues like that, expose them to the fact that what they're doing is fighting to remove power from government and put it back in their hands. And that that was the solution to this all along, that they didn't need this to know that. Um, and it has so far, it's been very effective. I mean, we've been uh, launched for uh, just uh, over six months now, uh, and we've already done an incredible amount of work. But that's what I am doing um, with You Are the Power is we have to show people, meet people where they are on issues they care about and show them how liberty is working. We've reached full saturation of the people who are going to read a libertarian book. A, even read it, and B, walk away changing their belief system. We now need to reach the people who need to be reached on things they care about and are concerned about and uh, and show them that we have the best way forward. Our guest uh, this half hour is uh, Freedom Crusader. Uh, Spike Cohen, when you're talking, when you're reaching out, so you, I mean, you're you're fighting a, mom- a monumental, a momentous battle, right? You're fo- fighting against, like, for example, I've got an 18 year old son. He is at community college, and he wants to go to UC. Now, my 18 year old son is is a, a pretty conservative kid. I mean, he's he's my son, so so he would have to be. You know, we he he actually went with me to that. Uh, Ron Paul symposium a number of years ago as, as like a 13 year old. Mm -hmm. So he, he knows about Liberty. He knows about freedom. Um, but he wants to go to university of California. He wants to go to UCLA or UCSB or UC San Diego. One of these, these, uh, brainwashing mills that they have. And I, I mean, he keeps telling me, don't worry, dad, I'm going to be okay. Don't worry, dad. I'll be fine. I won't let them put the microchip in me, but I bring that up in the context of Spike, you and I and and other people who believe in freedom are fighting against academia, the universities. We're fighting against television and 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 news and and popular music and movies. And it's like the other side, the side that wants to control and the side that wants is 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 like the, the, you know, demanding order, order. Um, the the side who who comes down on the on the authoritarian with the, the people with the authoritarian streaks control all outreach. 
the other side is never presented. The, the, the freedom option is never presented. And so what's it like for you who travels the country who, to promote your organization, um, to, to try and teach people freedom? What is that like for you? You're trying to teach when, when the entire system is stacked against freedom. What's that like? Well, it depends on the issue. So if I'm out working on something related to criminal justice reform, I'll find that a lot of those uh, media will be eager to take it on. Uh, and then I just have to resist them trying to turn it into an explicitly and solely racial thing um, and to focus on the actual abuse of power that's happening and an actual solution to that problem so it stops happening instead of just saying racism bad over and over again. Um, but, you know, you can pick and choose and get some successes there. With that said, um, I would dispute the idea that they control everything. And I'll give one example of that. Um, Joe Rogan has the most popular program ever on anything, um, more than any of the cable <laughs> news shows, more than any of the, uh, you know, anything that any of the other podcasts or websites or anything else, uh, YouTube channels or anything that's out there. And Joe's not even necessarily a, a libertarian through and through. He's, he's kind of a bit of a centrist, but he's open to different competing ideas and to examining them. And, you know, he has a show that should not be popular. It's like a three hour long, long form interview show. And yet it's easily the most popular. Um, and has been for quite some time. And uh, there are many other examples of this where there is, we are building our own and an increasing number of people are walking away from the media establishment, which is, let's be clear, the media establishment and everything you just listed uh, are all directly tied to government. You have the, the corporatist uh, media that is directly in bed with the, with the government. You have the um, higher, uh, institu higher learning institutions, which are in many cases actually only owned or controlled by the government. So really, it's just the government. This is just other uh, tentacles of the government octopus. Um, the other thing I would say is try to divest as much as possible. Like, so for example, unless uh, someone has to get a specific type of degree for a specific type of work uh, from a, a so-called liberal arts college, uh, then they should go and try to find their education somewhere else, it, it, whether it's through a tech school or, um, you know, something like that, or whether it's just to, to shadow other people and become an entrepreneur. That's what I did. I never actually went to college. Um, and then the other aspect of that is if you do need to go to one of those types of schools, find one whose, you know, academia is has a, a, a rigorous devotion to freedom of speech and, and freedom of expression, even if they're not necessarily libertarian or conservative, if they're at least supportive of people having different ideas and they aren't going to, you know, have your, your son punished for, you know, uh, being uh, a denier or phobic for having a different opinion, uh, then then I think that that's a good thing as well. But I mean, I, the, really, the answers are we need to build our own and we need to divest from the, the, the established order as much as possible. Do you see the 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 retreat from covid tyranny which i guess that's that's i mean when we were in the heat of this i remember saying i think i i, I was here on the air and i said no this is just the beginning you know they were mm -hmm. they i was absolutely sure we were going to get the vaccine passports i was absolutely sure uh that any any powers that the various levels of governments accumulated during you know the pandemic using the coronavirus as the the reason Oh, we have yep. to do this. It's for your own good. We're going to do it and you'll be glad. Um, I was sure that stuff wasn't going away, even if yeah, the, the yeah. numbers of sick people dropped and this and that. Well, it, it went away. Why? Why did it go away? And and will it come back? I mean, I saw we talked about yesterday in L.A. County, the the, the board said uh, or the, the health department said, yeah, you better put your mask on indoors. But it seems like even the Gavin Newsoms of this world are are they they know that if they try to do something, the people just won't have it. They made a strategic pause uh, because the public, even the public that had been supportive of them, some of the people that were you know calling the police on their neighbors for standing within six feet of each other when they were outside, even many of them start saying, "Okay, enough is enough. This has gone on too long." Um, and so they had to make a strategic pause and a strategic re retreat and back off for two reasons. Number one, they want to be able to use it in the future for other things, and they want to be able to claim it was successful. Uh, and with enough time, they can have enough people forget and, and so that they can try to convince them that the whole lockdown and, and, and mandate re 
regime was successful. But the biggest reason why they do this stuff is why they always do this whenever people start to resist and they back off. It's because they want to expose they don't want to expose the fact that government doesn't have any real power. If enough of us refuse to consent, they can't make all of us do anything or not do anything. So rather than admit to that, they go, oh, great news, everyone. We don't have to do this anymore. And that's, again, why we need to engage in mass noncompliance whenever they try this nonsense. Fight to vote them out so that they won't do it in the first place. And if that doesn't work, then refuse to comply. I love it. I uh, want to get back to uh, our guest right now. We have Spike Cohen on the phone. And this is his second time on Ray Appleton's show. And if I ever get a chance to fill in, Spike, you have to know that I'm, I'm going to call you because uh, I, I love your take on things and, and the way things ought to be. And and we're not we're not utopians. You know, libertarians, people think, oh, no. you're 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 a, I've heard you're a utopian. You want everything to be perfect. And, you you know, you've got this vision of a perfect society. No, I've got a vision of a society where I'm not being forced by bureaucrats and politicians to do what they want. And I don't think that what I'm asking for is is that big of of uh, of an ask to be left alone so that I can pursue the the dreams that that my family and I have have determined that we want to do. We we want that libertarians are not utopians. We want to live in peace. Now the the California state legislator that wakes up in the morning and thinks, "Oh god, you know these light bulbs are really bothering me." I'm going to ban them so that nobody else can use them. I mean, that's the yeah. utopian. That's the, the authoritarian nutcase to me. We're exactly. not the crazies. Exactly. There, let's be clear. There's no such thing as a utopia except in fiction. And anyone who's trying to sell you on one is either lying to you or themselves or both. What libertarians recognize is that we do as best as we can when the decisions uh, on various things are being made by the actual stakeholders in that situation. Whereas the the, the true utopians, the the big government progressives and the the you know the big government nationalists and everything else, their idea of utopia is that they get to control things centrally. And what we've seen time and time again is that when you put too much power and too much decision making in the hands of too few people, even if they're the most you know. Uh, incorruptible and brilliant people on earth, which they're usually the opposite, even if they are, it's impossible for them to know what every single one of us needs on every single thing. And so any way that we decentralize that power and that money and that decision-making ability back to the people who it belongs to, the, that's the best way we're going to live. It will not be perfect. There will still be every bad thing you can think of. There will just be less of it and a maximizing of the good things that we want, prosperity, good health and, and safety and everything else. Not going to be perfect. It'll be much better, though. You know, I, I was talking a little bit earlier before you came on about what, what people want. And I, I mean, I, I love to talk about the global warming thing because or what is it now? Climate emergency now uh, because yeah, they keep the climate changing, crisis, the climate yep. crisis. They keep changing it. But I love to talk <laughs> about it because, Spike, I do believe that it's going to be the, the, the biggest issue that that humanity's ever faced when when governments when western governments uh, outlaw the, the internal combustion engine and try to to repeal and roll back the industrial revolution and 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 they'll do it in steps but it's going to happen uh but i was saying that um I was saying that I just i just gosh i just lost my train of thought as i go off on tangent after tangent <laughs> Well, um, I want to I want to I want to bring up what you just said, because this goes back to the utopian vision. Yes. What we're, what the, 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 the climate alarmists or whatever you want to call them are trying to sell us on is the idea that climate change is real. It is being uh, uh, caused, at least in large part, by human activity. And if we throw enough money at them, they'll be able to convince the sun to stop warming us and to ignore the man-made activity that is much larger and growing exponentially in countries like China and Brazil and Russia and so forth. So even by their own measures and metrics, they're selling an absolute fantasy. China's not going to stop uh, producing and creating a, a growing middle class. Uh, Russia's not going to do that. None of these countries are going to choke themselves off because they're not in a position of luxury to be able to do so in the first place. So what they're selling us on is you be poor so other people can be less poor, and that will somehow fix the problem, even though by our own metrics that won't even happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Hey, Spike, I've got about a minute and a half, and I just wanted to thank you for coming on the Ray Appleton Show here. Uh, everybody from the grapevine on up almost to Sacramento got to hear your take. Will you please use the last minute to, to plug anything you want, your organization, a- anything you want to plug, how people can find you on social media? Because they absolutely should. Well, I appreciate that, Clint, and thank you again for having me on. Uh, Folks, I wish I had better news for you uh, coming into the Thanksgiving season, but we're working on making uh, better news. And if you'd like to be a part of that in growing the liberty movement in your community and communities across the country, I invite you to join You Are the Power at our website, youarethepower.net. If you want to follow what I'm doing on social media, it's not hard to find me. I'm Spike Cohen, or you can just go to the uh, ATF's newest Facebook post, and you'll find me there uh, (laughs) giving burning them a new one. And uh, But, uh, you know, again, and we have to continue to fight and grow the culture of liberty. Uh, oh, also, uh, in next March, I will be at the Libertarian Party of California Convention in Sacramento. If you go to lpca.org, you can find out more about that. But uh, again, we have to fight for freedom. Whatever your talents are, use them to spread an unvarnished uh, and unmistakable word of liberty. And if you'd like to be a part of what I'm doing, you are the power.net. Membership is free. We'd love to have you be a part of it. Clint, thank you again for having me on, man. Hey, Spike, I will tell you this. I am going to be seeing you in March because I am nice. going to be uh, I will be at that convention. I mean, do they do they let the libertarian Republicans in to those conventions? Yeah, every everyone is welcome. You you uh, even liberty Republicans are, are welcome at the, uh, <laughs> at the LPCA convention. Well, I will be there. And I, I have to, to tell you that my one of my favorite memories was um, meeting Harry Brown and, and Harry Brown was the libertarian yeah. Republic or the Libertarian nominee for president in 2000 and 1996, and yes. I, I actually one of the best messengers we've ever had, one of the greatest teachers we've ever had, and and yeah. R.I.P. to Harry. But I met him at the they had it in Anaheim by Disneyland, and uh, mm. as a young man, I got to meet him, and what a brilliant guy he was. Um, Spike, Absolutely. thanks a lot, and be well, and we'll talk to you soon, and we'll see you in March. Thank you. It's been a great hour of radio.